ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our main event. Hosted by Eric McMahon, it's cage time with John Morgan. And welcome everybody to the first cage side with John Morgan of 20. 20- 23 tremendously excited a lot of cool things that we are going to bring to you this year but man we had a great kickoff year last year in 2022 go back check us out in the archives grindcitymedia.com you can check us out on youtube soundcloud apple Podcasts, spotify wherever you get your streaming we had some really really cool episodes john brought some hard-hitting uh, uh interviews to us so definitely go check it out a guy that i can't wait to talk to for the first time this year my co-host, John Morgan. What's up, pal? I was missing it, man. We took one week off, and I was missing it. I'm like, I got to get back and talk to my man, Eric. So it's a new year, man. I'm excited about it. Like you said, we got some fun stuff in the pipeline. But, uh, man, I'm just glad to get back to it. I'm not, We kind of got a little pause. I mean, we don't have much of an off-season in the world of yeah. mixed martial arts. But I guess this is what would qualify as the off-season. It's maybe just like a couple little weeks. So the break was nice, I guess. Spent a little time with family. But I'm ready to get back to action, man. Action, you were on the call this past weekend, Fury Grappling. Tell us about that, man. Those are always great events. And for for grappling events, for like a regional promotion to bring UFC talent in and have grappling matches, that's cool as hell, man. It's so much fun. Yeah, I was out in Philadelphia, the 2300 Arena for Fury Professional Grappling 6. It's it's part of the, the CFFC family, basically. We have, you know, MMA shows. We do these grappling shows. We did a collegiate wrestling show for the first time ever last year but these grappling shows we do about one a quarter and it's fun it's submission grappling which is a lot of fun but once a year we started doing this kind of end of year spectacular where we have like you know 10 12 14 ufc fighters on the card and it's so much fun because it's it's all these you know guys and girls that you've seen compete and that you know their names but it, it's submission grappling so the, the 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 competitiveness is there but it's not the same nerves i mean as you completely understand, the nerves ahead of a grappling match, yes, of course, a little bit there. You want to win, but you're not worried about, hey, I could potentially get knocked out. You know, this is, I mean, this is huge things. So it's just so relaxed and so much fun. And it was a great, great event on UFC Fight Pass. If you haven't seen it yet, go check out the replay on UFC Fight Pass. But the main event, I, I mean, un- unbelievable. I mean, we had Jillian Robertson and Rose Nami Yunus in there. Jillian Robertson, most submissions all time but of, of, among women in the UFC against a former champ and Rose Nam Yunus and Jillian just absolutely looked phenomenal. So I, I, I just I love those shows so much. I love them no matter what. I love the grappling shows. They're 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 fun. But we can have that UFC talent on the roster. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's really fun because a lot of I guess jujitsu purists know the big jujitsu names. But when you you know, you know your your common fan can get introduced into submission grappling with names they know, which is I just think super cool. A name that we both know is a guy named Nick Harmeyer with CFFC, co-owner there. Guess who I got to come to jujitsu practice this morning? Oh, was it Nick you got Nick out there early on on with, January second, early in the morning with his fresh little white belt on. Man, he said he's motivated. He wants to learn jujitsu. He's getting into it. He has a wrestling background, but you know we're gonna, we're going to convert him. You know, I was a converted wrestler, so the older you get, man, maybe I ain't going to high pace wrestling that much. But uh, so it was fun. It was fun to have him out. But that's a great base to start from. You know, I mean, listen, I, I, as much as I love jujitsu, and I really do love jujitsu, man. I, I'll just tell people right now: if you're, if you're talking about a kid, maybe that's getting into it, or even yourself. Man, if you can start from that wrestling base, because the jujitsu, of course, that's where all the submissions come from. But, man, if you've got that wrestling base and you can dictate whether you're in top position, whether you're in bottom position, because, you know, the, the wrestler is going to have more of an impact in knowing how to get that in. You see so many jujitsu stylists that are incredible submission artists, but if they can't get the fight to the ground, you know, if they right. can't get themselves in the position they need to be in, it, it puts a little handicap on, on their overall game. So, you know, wrestling is a great base to start to go into jujitsu. That's what we love about MMA, mixing the martial arts, putting them all together, right? So here's a PSA statement for all fathers of young children out there, right? Myself included. My son is about to be four. When he turns five, I am not getting into getting him into jujitsu. I am getting him into wrestling first. And here's the reason why. Dad's out there, mom's out there, if you need something for your kid, because One, it just teaches great body awareness. Both of those sports do. But at the end of the day, from a practicality standpoint, I want to have my son. I do not want him to fall to his back at an early age. 
I don't want him to like now down the line, learning the guard, there's great things. I'm not talking any smack, but to your point, if a bigger, stronger kid comes after him on the playground, I need him to have that ability to change levels, get the, the scrap or the fight to where he wants it to be when he wants it to be there. And for that and no other reason, get your kid into amateur wrestling. I love that, man. That's that's a great thing. And I'll just I'll just chime in this. Look, if for whatever reason there's not a great wrestling program around, you know, certain parts of the country, it's not as predominant. You know, it, just get them into something and it, something grappling. I mean, n- no offense to the you know the old Taekwondo studios <laughs> and all, still you know phenomenal arts. But I'm telling you, get them into grappling of some kind. And and I'll just say it since you hit it because because I, I say the same thing as often as I can. If you have a young child, you know, get them into grappling of some kind because what I what I say about it is. Whether or not you can find wrestling or you can get jujitsu, the big thing is it's going to make them bullyproof. And why do I say this? I, my, my son has been training for a long time. I have a 10 year old son as well. What I always say is, I'm not saying he might not get his butt kicked on the playground at some point, but what I do know is he's not going to be afraid. And that's what bullies want, right? You remember as a child, a bully that knows that you haven't been in a fight, that knows you haven't been in physical contact, they're going to scare you into thinking, I don't know what's going to happen. But if your child has been in those, they've had those. Those moments where they're grappling where, hey, maybe practice goes a little bit hard because everybody gets a little bit mad. They at least knows what it feels like, and they're not going to be afraid. They're not going to be scared of that bully because that bully comes and tries to intimidate them. They're going to say, not to say that they're 100% going to win, but that's mm-hmm. what you you do not want your child being afraid out there on the playground, being scared of that person. If they know, hey, I know what this physical confrontation is going to feel like. I understand what it's going to be like. You're not afraid at that point, and then hopefully you can move past those situations. So to your point, I really do like what you're saying. I did the same with my – I think wrestling is, is huge, but get them into something or something. Get them into some grappling of some kind where they can feel that physical contact, that understand. They'll know what it feels like, and they won't be intimidated if it ever happens to them in real life. Amen, brother. Let's get this Hallmark After School special uh, <laughs> movie over with. Let's get into some hard-hitting MMA action. Something – now, we said we were on a little bit of a break, right? And just like MMA in general was on a little bit of an offseason. Except probably one of the funner events I saw all year. It took place on New Year's Eve over in Japan. It was a co-promotion, Ryzen and Bellator what just what a fun time now we've always done fantasy matchups we've been doing fantasy matchups our whole life i'm a wrestling fan what would have happened if goldberg would have taken on stone cold steve austin in their prime this that and the other guess what we kind of got some of that and these cold promotions are awesome i understand why it doesn't happen more but it was fun when it lasted it was a great event. Bellator MMA versus Rise. Saitama Super Arena, you know, kind of the, the the home of pride back in the day, the big New Year's Eve events. I mean, this kind of – it really did harken back to that feeling that, that we remember as old school fans, those New Year's Eve events. Love it. I mean, there's so much to talk about from a business perspective and because, as you said, this doesn't happen a lot. And there's a reason for it, man. There's a lot of logistical hurdles that have to be overcome to make this thing happen. And I think some of that was – you know, the, the TV, the, the the programs that happened, and people were saying, well, you know, why was it tape delayed to the United States? Why did we not get to see it live? And and I understand that, but I think you got to remember, you know, there were a lot of people I saw it, and, and I, got, I got, I'm not just going to be honest with you, I got into it online with some people that were mad at Bellator. And I'm like, guys, you do understand, Bellator didn't say, can you please tape delay this? You know what I mean? It was Showtime that said they wanted to tape yeah. delay. So th- there's all these logistical kind of hurdles that, that take place, but I'm so glad that they did it. And look, Ryzen put their fighters on the line. They invited Bellator over. They got Bellator's best. Ryzen goes 0 for 5 on the night. And you can say, wow, what a huge loss that they took. But I don't think so, man. I think there were Hell more no. Do you know how many? You know how many eyeballs in America that got? That's what I'm saying. You know, it, look, how many people were talking about Ryzen, you know, before this event versus after? Did they take some losses? Yeah, they took some losses. But I thought their fighters did a great job and I thought there were some very competitive matchups and there weren't very many one-sided clashes in there there were some really competitive matchups and again just people talking public awareness more people understanding this was just a win it was so cool I I hope it happens more I'd love to see more promotions do this the UFC is never going to co-promote let's just throw that out there now they don't need to they are the they are the the premier brand and and they don't need to co-promote and they're never going to but for every other brand out there why not not you know maybe don't have to do it all the time but just every now and then open up and put these kind of cross promotional matchups together. It just makes it fun. And it was fun. Let's talk about fun. I always say, especially, you know, and we see it to a degree with one championship, the Asian market in the spectacle that it is, 
is something that like, you know, maybe traditional MMA guys are like, rah, rah, rah. hell no. I'm here to be entertained. Like I'm in the Coliseum. I want to see gladiators. I got Maximus saying, are you not entertained? In this past weekend, I was entertained. Let's talk about the entrances. Now we've seen it a little bit. Like I said, old school pride. Plus now we have, you know, one championship that kind of does it. But this weekend, over the top. Now, you put a tweet out there that I think it really resonated with in the infancies. I didn't want to see the pageantry. I didn't want to see the over, you know, eccentric just for the sake of being uh, eccentric because it might take away from the legitimacy of the sport. We are well past that. Give me the uh, the eccentric. Give me the entrances. Give me the pageantry because it's part of it, man. It is part of it. It was fun. Yeah, I, I retweeted Juan Archuleta's uh, walk-in, which was just, I mean, inc- I mean, the whole thing's over the top, right? If you didn't get a chance to see this, you're talking about, I mean, a huge in-stage video, putting on costumes, coming in, doing crazy dances. Every- I mean, it's a show in itself. It, you know, it's 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 something crazy. I think, I think John McCarthy even said at one point, like, thank God I know he's in good shape because this is a workout just to get him to the ring, you know? <laughs> but 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 you know, what I tweeted stands so true to me in the beginning. I'll be honest, I, I didn't like that. Now, we're talking 15, 20, you know, 25 years ago where I wanted to make sure that mixed martial arts differentiated itself from professional wrestling because don't forget, you know, like I said, 15, 20 years ago, there were people that would watch this sport and say, is this real? Like, I don't even right. I don't even know. Is it, are these actual fights? Are these, are these scripted fights? What's going on here? And so I thought it was important to kind of separate the two from each other so people don't understand, no, listen, when you watch a mixed martial arts fight, you can trust – this is a real fight. This is, you know, to quote the UFC, as real as it gets. But I think we're past that at this point. I don't think there's anybody anymore that tunes in to the UFC, that tunes in to mixed martial arts contests of any kind and goes, is this even a real fight? I don't know. So at that point, now you got to bring back the entertainment side of it and say, you know, let's let's make something fun out of this. Let's make a, a spectacle out of it. Let's make it something spectacular. And, and I, I thought it was so cool to see, obviously, as you said, that, the Japanese market, man, they've done this forever. This this was pride back in the day. I mean, that's look, it's it's Nobuyuki Sakigabara. It's the same gentleman in charge. Like, he's basically just taking the same recipe and cooking it up in a new pot over here. And I love it. I'm in for it, man. I, I think people should embrace it. it. It just adds to it. It makes it something unique. Let's talk about Archuleta's entrance. And I was like, dude, how are this guy's thighs not blown the hell up? Bringing it back, you know, bringing his roots, his heritage. He had the headdress on. He he was doing, you know, the, the Native American dancing or the, the, some Aboriginal dance. I'm not even exactly sure which one. But with the headdress and everything, it was, it was just freaking amazing. And he probably burned 400 calories, 500 calories getting there. And you like, like you said, John McCarthy said he, uh, I know he's in good shape because the average person couldn't have done what he'd done just getting to the, to the, to the ring. Well, and, and I mean, from a physical standpoint, and think about it from a mental standpoint, right? When we talk about the nerves that go into it, like what, you know, what is about to unfold, you know, it's hand to hand combat once you step inside that. But to go up to that point and say, look, I'm putting on a show, I'm going to make this entertainment, I'm going to make this fun. Um, and, and as you said, pay tribute to his heritage as well, in addition to just putting on a spectacle. Unbelievable. And it, and it really did make for such a memorable scene. And that's why, I, you know, I, was, I, I had to retweet that because it, it was something cool and, and, and add a little flavor to it. I, I love seeing it, man, and, and I'd love to see more of that. And it was so cool just to see, you know, Juan Archuleta, A.J. McKee, I mean, Patricio. People, it seemed, I mean, everybody was so honored to be there, right? I mean, we, we all grew up watching this stuff. We all saw this. Yeah. As MMA fans, we saw the – the, the heyday of pride, and it's such a, an honor for everybody to be there. It seemed like Juan Archuleta was just embracing it the entire week. You know, what a what a special moment it was. You know, the, hearing his post-fight speech afterwards and just how excited he was to be there, you could tell it, it wasn't just another fight for him. You know, this was something really, really special. And so it was so cool to see that for the athletes involved, this meant something. And, and I love the event overall, man. I just I, – I really did think it turned out so well. And, and like I said, even though – you know, Ryzen went 0 for 5. I, I think they've got to believe that it turned out well for them as well. And I hope that we're going to see this as a tradition. Now, I, you know, there was a, a conference call beforehand. Scott Coker, I asked him about it. I said, look, is this a one-off? Is this a partnership? He said, look, we're going to do at least two of these. You know, we're, we're going to go over there, and then it, we're going to ask them to reciprocate, and they're going to come over here to the United States. So at some point, 
next year. We should expect Ryzen to come over, and it'll be a Bellator show at that point, right? It'll be in a cage. It'll be, you know, the unified rules versus the rules we saw over there, which the rules over there are crazy, man. Knees to a grounded opponent, soccer kicks, all that stuff. So we're going to see it come over here. But I hope this becomes an annual tradition, man. I really do. I just think this show turned out so well. If you didn't get a chance to watch it and you got some downtime, you're still enjoying your holiday, you can go to Showtime. You can catch the replay. Again, it was on tape delay, but that did allow them to kind of edit it down a little bit for Showtime. So the Showtime broadcast, it moves along pretty quick. Um, and I think it's worth checking out, man, just to see the, the pageantry. It's, it's something different. What do we say, Eric? You, 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 if you're going to be successful in this, you, you can't just be UFC light, right? You got to do something different. You got to have a little bit different format. You know, one championship. They, they've they got Muay Thai. They've got kickboxing. They've got submission grappling. The PFL, they've got a season format. You got to win, and then you go into this tournament, and then you get a million dollars. Everything's a little bit different. You want different? Go watch this show, man. Completely different. The way it's presented, <laughs> over the top, unbelievable. If soccer kicks and stomps were built for one person, after watching AJ McKee, I would say that rule set is built for him. And I say that because even the angles that he was getting these these stomps and these kicks off was, I mean, it kind of defies logic a little bit. There was one uh, soccer kick to the head that he threw in the weirdest position, and it landed flush. Yeah, it's wild, man. So it, it's funny. So a soccer kick for anybody that maybe not aware. I mean, th think about exactly that. A, a, a ball is sitting on the ground. You're standing up and you just take a, a kick at it. Well, in Japan, you could do that to somebody's head, which I'll be honest is a little bit scary. It is one that I don't know that people will ever get over and add into the unified rules. But I will say this: the knees to the head of a grounded opponent, right? That changes the game to me spectacular. I like that. I wish we could have that into the unified rules. I agree a hundred percent. You can't stall out at that point, right? So what you're thinking is if you're on your knees, if you're if you're if you're kind of in a front headlock type position, a lot of times you can kind of stall out from that moment because you know that your head is in danger from taking those knees. You don't get that luxury. And AJ McKee, to your point, man, he took full advantage of that. He was leaping into him, throwing kicks, throwing knees, but facing an incredibly talented jujitsu artist like he was in Roberto de Souza. He, he Satoshi had to move around. He couldn't stay in those positions because he knew he couldn't take that damage. And it didn't allow him to set up some of the positions that he wanted. AJ McKee took full advantage of it. It's fun. I would like to see knees to head of ground opponent. Soccer kicks. I mean, it's it's just something about him that seems weird to me. I, I, I don't know. They, they seem a little bit non-sporting, so to speak. But at least knees to head of ground opponent. I would love to see. I would actually really like to see it as well. I was having this conversation with my wife because we were sitting down watching and he kicked him in the AJ McKee kicked him in the head. She was, it really took her off guard. She's, she's a huge MMA fan, but she's not familiar with that rule set. Um, you know, especially as me being a ref, she's like, Whoa, you know? And I was like, no, 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 no. That's, that's legal here. And she's like, well, I don't like it. And I'm like, well, there's a little bit different. You can knee, you can kick. I like the knees and I'm going to, and I'm going to tell you exactly why, even from a referee standpoint, I do I like the knees because you sitting cage side and me being in the cage, you can attest to this. There's an intricacy game being played when somebody's standing up, my hand is down. Now it's up. My hand is down. I'm going to explode up now, but no, I didn't get the underhook. I'm going to put it right back down. And this, this weird little game is played. And a lot of time, the person who, who inflicts the blow is penalized for just trying to, to advance the fight in a lot of ways. And uh, for that reason, and honestly, for that reason alone, I'm a proponent for knees to the head. Yeah, it, that that's the worst when you see that. Because there's one thing between a truly downed opponent, you know, somebody that's true, but versus quote unquote playing the game, right? Like, oh, I put my hand down now, and obviously it changes from. Well, I don't even want to get into that. The yeah, one hand, two everywhere. hand, oh. knuckles, flat palm, fingertips. In in some cities, it's one finger. In some, it's all like three fingers and some, the whole palm has to be down. Like I can't keep them straight. Sometimes I have to go wherever commission I am. I'm reading the rules. And then, and then I got to start ingraining it in my head. Cause it changes, you know, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I hate that. The unified rules need to get unified from state to state. If we're going to have a rule set in the United States, let's make sure everybody's on it. So I won't get into that tangent. Cause I could fill up the rest of the show. Just talking about how angry I am that we have different rules in different jurisdictions. But to your point, yes, that thing of I'm gonna play the game, I'm gonna I'm gonna qualify myself as a downed opponent, even though I'm not actually a downed opponent. That is annoying as hell. And if you just say, hey, knees are fine, 
then you no longer have to worry about that right now. Now the onus is no longer on the fighter to qualify themselves as a downed opponent. Now the onus is on the fighter to get your head out of a position where it's in danger of being need and to adjust your position. And I think what you find in that is it creates more scrambles. It creates more transitions. It creates more movement because you're not just stalling out in a position, making sure that you're safe. You're actually working yourself to safety. So that one I would actually really, really like to see added to the, the – quote unquote unified rules that <laughs> the ununified unified, unified rule. Hey, this is my last point on this rule set and then I'm gonna um I'm kind of just gonna stop bitching about it. <laughs> and as a ref, and this is completely legal and it defies the rule set. Fighter A downs himself on purpose not to get need. Fighter B undowns him by just lifting his hand up to throw a knee. And I'm just like, how am I supposed to keep this shit straight? And it's happening in real time, right? This is not like what's crazy is, you know, you go back and you watch the instant replay and you're like, you know, frame by frame. And you go, well, you can clearly see he's down. He's not down. But you got to remember, as you're watching this unfold, it's bang, 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 bang. And instant. then a lot and of again, the times is when did he initiate the knee? Was his hand still down when the knee was initiated? Did the knee land before uh, – was the knee – initiated before the hand touched the ground because those are all the intricacies here that we're really really talking about it take it off the table well i was gonna say and let and let me point this out yeah and take it off the table but again here's why i think it's so important to get the rules the same state to state across the board because if you're a fighter or even more importantly you know your high level officials they're refereeing in different states from day to day from week to week so now we just talked about what you have to evaluate in real time, how fast it is, you've got to figure that out instantly. But then you also have to add in the fact of remembering what state you're in. And I know that may sound silly, but when you're traveling every week, when you're at a different place every weekend, now you have to factor in, hold on, what did I just watch? And, 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 and now B, what state am I in at this exact moment and what rule applies here? You're just complicating the job for the officials. And that's why I think we really need to make sure that we get everybody on the same page across the and country. And I'll, I'll give you a prime example for that. Mississippi, it's one finger. One finger is a downed opponent. But yet you can 12 to 6 elbow. Crazy, right? <laughs> I love one that. Finger. That's, my, that's my favorite thing when we're in Tunica for CFSC. Is I, just, I mean, nobody's really used it yet. I mean, which just goes it, to show you how little that rule is actually in effect. Yeah. But I, I, come on, I want to see somebody throw some 12 to 6s. But then you go from Tunica... 30 minutes, uh, you know, 30 minutes east, and we're in the state of Tennessee. Now the whole palm has to be on the ground. That's a 30-minute difference in a huge change in the rules. I digress. AJ McKee did it. AJ McKee did a phenomenal job using this rule set. I want to get into this fight because this fight with Roberto de Souza was unbelievable. Now everybody just sees. AJ McKee, unanimous decision. If you didn't watch it, I have never seen AJ McKee get controlled the way D'Souza controlled him. Even in some like taking heavy damage, he was rolling for knee bars. He was, you know, just doing amazing stuff. Not only that, did he have his back in the second and third round? He got multiple takedowns in all those rounds and he stood on his feet and traded with him. And let's be honest, it's the damage that really got A.J. McKee the victory there. Definitely. This was a phenomenal fight. If you, if you don't have time to watch the whole event, at least go watch this main event because what you're seeing is two of the best lightweights in the world put on one of the greatest fights you'll ever see. I mean, it was, it was spectacular. And, you know, two guys that probably don't get the recognition that they deserve, but this is what this thing is all about, is, is bringing the best in the world together and putting on high-level mixed martial arts contests. And these two guys did it. And, and that's why I say, you know, look, I'll be honest, going into this, I, you know, I, I thought that Bellator had the ability to sweep this, but I did know that there were a couple of contests that, that scared me a little bit. Kyoji Horiguchi, I was pretty confident he was going to win. Patricio Pitbull, I was pretty confident he was going to win. This matchup between McKee and Satoshi, I wasn't so sure who was going to win this because stylistically, it is a tough one, right? I mean, AJ McKee has phenomenal grappling, but guess what? So does Roberto de Souza, and he showed it in this matchup. And so, Boy, how about the fact that AJ McKee in the opening round is like, yeah, I'll jump in your guard. Let's go do this. I'll grapple with it. You know what I mean? Credit to not so he, much in the second or third though. No, I, in the first round, he's, I, he's, yeah. I did it a little bit. I did it a little bit. That was enough. Right. You know what I mean? But I, I oh man, this was, it was a, a phenomenal fight. And I think both guys really, really deserve credit. And again, man, it was so cool because Scott Coker, Bellator president, he said it going in. He said, listen, man, 
these co-promotions are a little bit scary, right? Because, you know, you do stand to lose something. If you go out there and you look bad, like all of a sudden your promotion takes a hit, your athletes take a hit. But I just don't think that's what happened here. I thought I think that we saw phenomenal matchups. Ryzen was able to gain some awareness. These athletes were able to gain some awareness. The Bellator guys, you could just tell how much fun they were having, how honored they were to be there. I mean, this was just, to me, this was a huge win all the way around. Again, I'll say, the only criticism, it is unfortunate that it didn't air live. However, I will say, you know. Uh, what time would ever, it have been, though? Exact, that's what I was going to say. How, would you have really stayed up? Now, listen, young me, I used to back in the day. I would have said it would have been 5 a.m. Eastern would have been uh, the start time. Not many people are going to watch that. But I will say this. And, again, the criticism I do, I do not believe, you know, falls on Bellator shoulders. It falls on Showtime. And I'm not trying to call Showtime out or anything. But I will say – and I'm not a television executive. I'm sure they have their reasoning. And, and look, there may have been situations in place where they're not allowed to air it live at all because Ryzen's TV partners have the sole live contract rights. I mean, that's, that's the hurdles you have to jump through here. Um, you know, so – these are the things that are difficult. And as we say, well, why don't people co-promote more often? These are questions you have to have. If we do a co-promotion, do you get to sell the commercial advertising space or do I, do you get the revenue for the, for the, uh, you know, the logos that are on the mat or do I like, these are all realistic business things. And that's why it doesn't necessarily work out exactly as you want. But I would just say, don't criticize, man, be proud of these organizations and what they did. They put on a phenomenal show. And yeah, that AJ McKee, Roberto de Souza matchup, go check it out. If you didn't, phenomenal and man just props to everybody that was involved in this event i'd like to do i i, I want to watch more of souza coming forward i didn't really know much about him heard the name right seen a little highlights here and there maybe a huge fan if you're going to take on a athletic freak wrecking machine that is aj mckee and you are going to show out the way he did in a losing effort but he lost nothing in that fight I'm going to go as far as to say he didn't even lose the striking exchange measurably. I agree. I agree. Even though he's a, a you know a grappling expert by trade, man, I thought he looked great on the feet as well. And look, if you watch that fight, there's no way that you're saying, I don't want to see that guy again. No, you're hoping that when Ryzen comes over in the summertime or whatever that may be to the United States, you're saying, please make sure you bring that guy over. Let's find another matchup for him because, look, A.J. McKee is one of the best lightweights in the world. And, and, and to your point, he hung with them. He made it competitive. He had a claim that he won the fight. You know, I, again, I think A.J. McKee won, but it was it was close enough that you could – it's not like he got blown out of the water by any stretch. And I hope they bring him back over. UFC judging criteria. Who won that fight? Good question. Good question. You could go Roberto, right? You could yep. go Roberto on that Yep. One. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, and, and here's the great thing about the broadcast. They preference this throughout the night for us. Damage weighs the most. Take everything out of the equation. Damage weighs the most. And D'Souza, unfortunately, just wore the damage a lot worse than A.J. McKee did. It is. Well, boy, I, that's one thing. And we talk about damage even in the unified rules here in the United States. It's one thing that bugs me a little bit, right? Because damage... How do you actually weigh that, right? I mean, like, like some people just have scar tissue and cut open easy. Some people just swell different than us. And so it, it's such a hard thing to actually measure. It's not like this is a video game where we have a, you know, a power bar and we can see it, you know, moving down and we know exactly who has enough energy or who took, you know, less damage because it was measured all the way. It's such a, it's such a dangerous way to measure things. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult one, but I, I think they got it right here. I really do think they got yeah, it right. But no, no problem with the decision. Great, it's just great in, the, in, the, in that judging context, 100% right score, you know, yep. right person won. In another, this, that fight would be talked about for a long time, no matter who won. And listen, remember, when they come back over to the United States, it's going to be judged differently. Now, I'm not, I don't necessarily want to see the same fights put back together, even the ones that were competitive. Like Juan Archuleta and Sutro Kim, that was a great fight as well. But, you know, let's let's put some fresh matchups together. But, yeah, you're right. When it comes back over here, it'll be a little bit different rule set. Of course, cage to ring is a lot different as well. You know, I mean, that, that, that changes things a lot. You know, when you see people up against the ring, you know, the positions are a whole lot different and what happens in there. Uh, I, I, I'm just looking forward to it, man. I just I think this was such a great step for both these organizations, and, and I hope it's one that they're going to continue to do. And – I hope it's one that other organizations will say, hey, you know what? We want to take part in that too. You know, let, let the PFL say, hey, why don't we get involved in one of these? I mean, I, I say 
if you're anybody outside the UFC, try to find a way to work with other organizations because if you can't, it just opens up matchups. It opens up talent sharing. It opens up different things. I, I think it's a win-win. There are difficult business hurdles that you have to figure out, and that's why it's not easy. That's why it's difficult. But, man, it's just so cool. This event generated more discussion than any singular Ryzen event by itself or Bellator event by itself has that I can remember in the entire year. When you put the sum of the parts together, it's greater than them by themselves. And dare I say more entertaining. So one last one that I want to talk about is, you know, I kind of off air, I said to you, is this Johnny Dotson 2.0? Because bam, a minute and a half into it, we, he looked like that young, just running around Johnny Dotson and uh, had a pretty vicious knockout. That was the yeah. only fight that was a, that was a run through. Think about the year that he's had, 2022. John Dawson got a win over Francisco Rivera on the regional MMA scene, got a win in bare knuckle, which, by the way, that one was 40 seconds. Then gets this win over Hideo Tokoro in, in less than two minutes. I mean, it does. It seems like John Dawson is rejuvenated, man. It seems like something special is happening with him. And, uh, man, I, I, I love to see it because John Dawson is entertaining as it gets. He's, he's hilarious on the microphone. He's, he's you know, he's a super funny guy. Uh, and, and obviously, he's entertaining as, a, as an athlete as well, man. The dude will come out there and swing. So I, I love this performance from John Dodson. It just makes me excited to see what he's going to get done in 2023. So nothing in the next week or so that anything major on the docket when it comes to MMA. MMA Why? So let's have some fun. 2023, new year, new me, right? New year. What are we looking forward to? I'll start first. John Jones, is this unicorn going to fight this year? He is going to fight. Then, I, I don't know, there's, there's contract stuff, and then is he not? He may. He's probably going to fight before the end of 2022. That went quiet real quick. That got blasted right by. John Jones, the fight to make, him and Francis Ngannou. But what's, what's up with Francis Ngannou? Is there a new contract? Is there not a new contract? Is he want to box? Is his knee okay? That's very, that's something I like, I can't wait for if or when that fight happens. That's probably at the top of my list. What I'm most looking forward to, to 2023. I can't disagree with you on that at all, because listen, you know, this John Jones move to heavyweight, you know, it was, it's been talked about for years and years and years, you know, I mean, earlier in his career, right. He, he said, look, I'll, I'll probably move up to heavyweight at some point. And, you know, you look at his brothers in the NFL. I mean, obviously they're carrying massive amounts of, of weight and strength. I mean, I, you know, he's got the build to do it. But we just didn't know if he ever would, and he was still dominant at light heavyweight. And then finally says, look, I'm committed to it. But Eric, we're closing up on three years that we haven't oh. had a chance to see John Jones. And to me, and I know there's a lot of people that don't like John Jones, and I get it. I understand he's, you know, he's, he's been a little bit difficult to deal with sometimes outside of the cage, some of the choices he's made, some of the things he's done. I understand why he's been polarizing and some people don't like him. But as far as what happens – inside those cage walls to me john jones is the greatest of all time and the fact that we haven't gotten a chance to see him in three years and we haven't got to see the greatness uh, of him perform and compete uh, i it, it just it sucks to be honest it's a bummer man and, and i want to see him and, and, and if he can go up and wait and beat francis nagano which if we're talking about from a technical perspective john jones is the technically more sound fighter there's no yes. question about it yes. but Francis Nagano has that big leveler and that but. he's the most yeah, the most powerful dude that we might have ever seen in the sport. One touch, and it doesn't matter about your technicality because you're sleeping on the canvas right now. So, man, you know, obviously Francis Nagano had the knee injury and he's recovering from that. Seems like he's just about good. He was having the contractual issues as well, where he wanted to, you know, work things out with the UFC. So there's there's all these things that need to happen, but it seems like the runway is clear now. It seems like everything is kind of in position at this point. It's got to come together. And, and, and look, from John Jones' perspective, I understand, you know, he didn't want to come back and just face Curtis Blaze or just face Steve Amy. I mean, look, those are all big fights as well. But, you know, he wants the title shot right away. And I get and it. And he I deserves mean, it. He absolutely deserves it. The most dominant light heavyweight champion we've ever had. One of the most dominant champions we've ever had, period. I mean, the, the guy, he absolutely deserves it. And... You think about it from a USC perspective, it's a business, right? I mean, what does more business that you want that question mark? How does it, that's what we're talking about? How does he perform at heavyweight? Oh my gosh, can he actually do this? What does he look like? Will he perform? 
all those questions, you want to roll those into a title fight. You want to roll those into a, a non-title fight and then have a title fight. No, you're trying to sell pay-per-views, and the question marks are, but three years. We're talking about three years. Gosh, man, it's got to happen this year. It's got to happen this year. Because, listen, man, as great as John Jones is, and, and we're talking about how – look, again, I just said I think he's the greatest of all time. But three years away, how does that impact things? Has he aged in this time? Has Will his timing be there? Has everything – I don't know. I mean, oh, it's got – yes, it's number one. It's number one. It's got to happen. As, as an insider that you are, is John Jones – portion of this deal complete has he agreed to terms if they presented him the fight today would he take it have those conversations already been had because let's rewind that's what almost originally hung this up to begin with i'm not fighting for less than xyz no <laughs> no, I don't think it's completely done, Hassan. I think it's still going to be discussions that need to have. From from what I understand behind the scenes is that everybody's talking about it, but nobody has agreed entirely to what's going to happen. Now, there's a lot of moving parts. As we said, Nagano's got to come back from injury. He's got to sign his deal. In. There's so many moving parts. But no, unfortunately, I, I don't think it's entirely agreed to in principle. And Listen, the, the bottom line is the UFC is going to stick to their guns on the business model, and that's uh, a little bit frustrating. But – you know, with a lot of these athletes, and it's something we've seen happen time and time again. I mean, this is what Randy Couture held out for so many years ago. He said, listen, I don't want to just, you know, be a partner on the back end where I get a percentage of the pay-per-view. I want to know going into a fight exactly what I'm going to make, which is, you know, what you would consider the boxing model, more or less, where the boxing, you know, promoter comes in and they say, listen, here's what we're going to bid on this. Here's what we think we can generate in revenue out of this. And we'll guarantee you this. And the UFC has always done things a little bit different. They said, no, look, we'll guarantee you a base pay. That's no problem. But in terms of the big upside, you're going to be business partners with us. And that's going to motivate you to want to try to sell this fight. That's going to motivate you to want to be part of all that we do to help promote this. And you see it from both perspectives. Like, I understand why the athlete would say, just tell me what I'm going to make up front. And I understand why the UFC as a pro promoter would say, no. We'll share on the back end with you because we want to know that you're as motivated as we are to help make this thing a reality. So long answer, no, uh, it's uh, it's not quite done yet. So uh, as excited as you just got me now, I'm, now, now I'm getting frustrated with the business. And, and, and ask Affliction how well the upfront guaranteed money worked, right? So That's it. I mean, I get it. I mean, look, I think we all stand here and say we want these athletes to make as much money as humanly possible, but – you know, at the end of the day, the UFC model does kind of make some sense where you're like, look, mm -hmm. I, we're not going to limit what you make. You can make a billion dollars if you want to make a billion dollars. We got to sell a whole lot of pay-per-views to make that happen. So let me make sure that you're tied into this so that you do go do those interviews, that you do make sure that you're, you know, fired up at the press conference, that you do want to film the, the embedded episodes, that you do want to film the countdown episodes because you understand all that is going to help promote your opportunity to make money. I, I mean, you could definitely understand it from both sides. Moving on to what I don't even know if I'm looking forward to this or if it's just, and I don't want to say nagging, but it's just this cloud that's always, and not positive or negative, it's just this cloud that's always looming over the sport of mixed martial arts. Connor McGregor, the notorious. Conor, now more than ever, the notorious Conor McGregor. Does he come back in 2023? Boy, that's a great question. Um, I think so, right? I think he does compete again in 2023. But, of course, the first thing we got to figure out is the weight class, right? Definitely doesn't look like it's happened at 155 pounds. It's it probably going to happen. even going to happen at 170 is beyond me at this point. I'm telling you, man, you, you look at social media. My man is bricked up right now. He's, he's, he's getting jacked up. He's getting yoked. Uh, yeah, I mean, it can, middleweight, he, he's way too small for middleweight. So it's, uh, welterweight has got to be the highest that he goes. But, you know, I don't know what he's walking around at right now. But, you know, listen, um, he's the biggest star in the history of the sport. There's absolutely no question about it, man. When Conor mm -hmm. McGregor talks, people listen, and he moves the needle, so to speak. He is a, a guy that I would love to see compete again. 
I, I don't know. I mean, again, we talk about the money that he made. You know, obviously the Mayweather fight changed everything for Conor McGregor. And then you get into proper 12. And then you get into, all, you know, everything else. He doesn't need to fight. That's the thing is he doesn't need to fight. I think he still does have that passion, but he's living an awfully nice life. You know, does he really want to dedicate himself full time to it? I think he does. I think that competitor still lives within him and still wants to get out there and, and, and step in the cage and prove something. You know, obviously, I don't think he's happy about, you know, the, the last couple uh, showings that he's had and, and where things stand. But he doesn't have to. You know, I mean, he's, his, his place in MMA history is absolutely secure. His financial independence is, is seemingly, uh, you know, secure as well. Generational generational wealth it certainly appears to be generational wealth i mean obviously none of us are actually seeing the books but from all indications like he's doing just fine as you said for generations so i don't know if he'll come back but i think he will i think he wants to i think it just comes down to what matchup you put together for him and i will say this look when he when, when he competes man the world comes together to watch it so i mean it would be a big event no matter who it's against i think it's just a matter of who he wants to, to fight against and 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 you know, the timing is everything, all that. So I, 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 I'm going to say a hopeful yes, a hopeful yes. And I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it because, the, you know, social media Connor is all right. You know what I mean? But the, but actual fighting Connor is, is something else, man. And people tune in for it. It's great for the sport, man. When that guy competes, it's great for the sport because people, they, they, they stick their heads up and they pay attention, man. This guy's the biggest star in the history of the sport. I'd love to see him back. I'm going to cautiously, optimistically, Say we do see him at some point this year. If you are Michael Chandler, no matter what, are you waiting all year just to see if that fight materializes? I think no so. matter what, like even if you don't have any guarantee, it's it's let's say it's even 40% chance. Do you not take another fight all calendar year to see if red panty night delivers? I think so. I think at least I mean, at least you're waiting till March, April, May, you know what I mean? To just see. There's no reason to rush into it. You know, uh, th th that's the biggest fight you can make. And, and by far, especially if you can find a way to share in on the. Now, look, it, it, you know, if you're not getting pay-per-view points out of it, if you're not getting a new contract out of it, then maybe you don't care. Although, I mean, even just still for your profile, it'd be massive. I mean, even at this point, having a win over Conor McGregor does mean something. It helps move you forward. It helps propel you forward. So even if you don't get more money out of it immediately, you'll probably get more money out of it down the line because it just raises your profile. I don't think you'd wait all year. Like you don't want to wait till December and you're still not sure. But I think you at least you don't rush things out of the start of 2023. You kick it around to March, April, May. If you're not hearing something by that point, you know, if you're not sure at that point, then maybe you look at something else. But yes, the opportunity to fight Conor McGregor, it's worth waiting on. The UFC seems like that's the says they, they think that's the fight to make. I believe Connor on social media says he would take that fight. Obviously, Michael Chandler's been calling for that fight. Us as fans, is is that the fight we want to see? I mean, the the fight that I want to see at some point is the Nate Diaz trilogy, right? You know what I mean? That's I think that's the fight that everybody wants to see more than any. But you got to figure out what's happening with Nate Diaz at this point, right? Nate wants to, to exercise his options as a free agent. And that's that's just smart. You know what I mean? I think Nate Diaz realizes at this point in his career, he's a massive star. He's not going to get a chance to sign too many more contracts, right? He's not a guy that fights three, four times a year. So, you know, he signs another deal. Maybe it's his last deal. I'm not saying it is for sure, but maybe it is. So he, he knows he's not going to get a chance to test this free agency, you know, too many more times in his career. So now's the right time to do it. I applaud him for doing that. I do think... You know, I've seen a lot of people just say that, like, Nate Diaz is, is out. He's leaving the UFC. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think he could absolutely end, end up back in the UFC. But the wise thing to do is to, is to see what your options are. See what kind of financial opportunities are out there because it just helps you. If you can go to the UFC and say, hey, by the way, you know, Bare Knuckle just offered me this or this MMA organization just offered me this. Can you match that? That just helps you. That just makes things better for you. So, I think even over the Michael Chandler flight, I, I think that people would rather see the Nate Diaz trilogy first and foremost. But if Nate outside, Diaz is available, outside, outside of Nate Diaz, is Chandler the one that the masses want to see? That's it. That's what I'm saying. I, if, if Diaz can't happen, if Diaz signs elsewhere, Chandler's option number one. That fight just, we talked about it before we even hit the record button, is because I could see this fight going both ways in the first round how damn explosive Michael Chandler is, and he's not scared to walk through the fire. But you get clipped by that power left by Connor, and Michael Chandler, 
you know, he he rebounds from getting knocked down, but he gets clipped a lot and he gets put down on his butt a lot. Well, I think that's what makes the matchup so entertaining, right? Is that he does. Michael Chandler does get hit. You know, you always say, you know, you know, it's like Eddie Alvarez back in the day. We always used to praise Eddie Alvarez. The king for of the underground. Great- yeah. And I just saw him this week back in Philly, by the way, man. He is doing good out there, man. Ran into Eddie Alvarez. Great to see him out in Philly. Uh, but we always used to praise his chin, right? Like he would get clipped and then he would fight back. But when you praise somebody's chin, it's because you've seen them get punched a lot, right? And that does happen with Michael Chandler. Like he gets clipped. And, and Conor McGregor, man, that left hand, say what you will. Man, he could put you out with that left hand. But, again, where is Conor McGregor at this point? You know, where is his motivation? I mean, he's, he's training, but, it, you know, is he really pushing it, you know, given all his business interests and how much he's enjoying life? Deservedly so, man. I mean, that's what prize fighting is for, is to stack up cash while you're in there so that you can enjoy the rest of your life. But, you know, is he, you know, is the timing going to be there? Who, we don't know, but that's what makes it so intriguing. That's what makes it so enticing. I think that's why I fight uh, the, the people would like to see the fight. I've named two, John Jones, Conor McGregor. You got any for me? What are you looking forward to? I mean, those are two on my list as well, so there's no question about it. But I think one that I would throw out there is just, man, this Leon edwards Kamaru Usman trilogy fight, uh, you know, which we thought was going to happen in March in London. We're not 100% sure that's going to happen yeah, anymore. Okay, what, what is going on there? Exactly. It seems like rumor mill, and then it's not rumor. And then well, it is rumor. Then it's I, not rumor. Look, it's two months out, and it hasn't been announced yet. And then we see Kamar Usman. He's uh, promoting fights over in Africa, and he shows up, and he's got a brace still on his hand. It's scary. We don't know if it's going to happen. I mean, still, eh, eh, we're hoping it happens in March. Uh, it's got to be the next fight. I mean, look, there's talks about, you know, Masvidal swooping in. And, and, and maybe, it could, and look, if it is Masvidal, I mean, you, you can't say from a meritocratic point of view that he deserves a title fight right now, but from a storyline point of view in terms of, you know, they have the history with the backstage incident, the three-piece in the soda, you know, for him to come in and fight Leon Edwards, I, I'm in for it. I'm all in for it. Sign me up. So if, if Mazadal gets the title shot, I'm not going to be the one saying, oh, he doesn't deserve it, he doesn't, because there's a storyline there that I'd like to see. But even if that's what happens in March, I mean, at some point, we got to see this fight with Usman again, right? I mean, that was... That to me was the moment of 2022, right? That was the most how shocking, you like me now, unbelievable, right? I mean, that to me was the time capsule moment of 2022, man. And so we've got to run that back because you're talking about, you know, who's been dominating that fight up to that point. But as you said, Edwards with that big high kick, and then you know the footage comes out afterwards where they're. They're training that exact high kick, that exact sequence. They're talking about it. And then all the emotion, man, the, the clips of him talking to his mom. and just, I, I mean, that was the story of last year. It was unbelievable. I'm getting goosebumps now thinking about it, man. Like, that was unbelievable. But I, I, I got to see it again. And then you think about all that was on the line for Usman, man. He was, I mean, you know, he's up there about to tie Anderson Silva. And about, I mean, all these all-time marks that were just missed out on a fight because of one thing. And, Gosh, that's why we love the sport so much, right? Is one second, one minuscule mistake, and everything can change for you. And that's what happened. Uh, so I'm, I'm anxious to see that one, you know, happen again. I'm anxious to see that one happen again. Whether it be Usman, whether it be Masvidal, the UFC will get my 74.99. Wait, wait, oh shit! It's 2023. They're gonna get my 79.99. We got, yeah. They got that that last five bucks out of me this year. It's going to keep going up. And I will say this. I will say this. Not that it makes it any easier. But remember, that is an ESPN decision, not a UFC decision. The ESPN is the one that, that's paying for all the broadcasting rights. They're the one that's mm-hmm. setting those rates. And really, I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, right? Like ESPN Plus, obviously, that went up this year as well. I mean, that's – look, that's that's the unfortunate part. As, as, as live rights continue to escalate in price across the board in sports. I mean, live sports are where it's at, right? The way TV is consumed these days, it's all about advertising. How do you get people to watch advertising? You make sure they're watching it live. They're not fast forwarding through anything. Now you're seeing it, right? Like, man, I was watching, I've been watching Tulsa King. I don't know if you've been checking that one out yet. It's solid on Paramount Plus. So I don't Sloan. have Paramount Plus. Somebody else has told me to get it just for that show. I'm telling you, I like the show. It's good. But I guess they have different levels of it. I think they have like one that, but the level that I have, uh, it has commercials in it. Like there's no way you can fast forward through it, right? So even though we're doing this on-demand programming, streaming programming, they make it so you can't fast forward through it. But anyway, 
But what I'm saying is, I mean, it's look, it's that advertising revenue that helps support this big dollars that people are able to pay out for programming. And so as those things continue to escalate, man, they're going to pass the, 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 the cost on to the consumer. But um, yeah, check out Tulsa King. It's good. That's my <laughs> <list>. <laughs> Alrighty. So getting set to wrap up the first show here of 2023 on cage side with John Morgan and a scoop that broke in an interview you conducted that we played on this very podcast. Henry Cejudo, Algermain Sterling was confirmed. Not only by Ali, Cejudo's manager, but it was even confirmed by Aljo in a, in, in a reply message to you. Still, not a word about this from the UFC. Has anything changed? Your wife, you know, does pub, does relate public relations for <laughs> for him, for Ali. What's going on? If you don't know, nobody knows. Uh, I know. It, you know, it's funny. So we don't get to talk about that stuff around the Morgan household. But yeah, no. I, it, look, Ali Adelzi told me, look, this thing is done. It's all, it's all, you know, signed. Well, he didn't say signed. He just said it's done. And knowing Ali the way that I know Ali, I think he was just saying, hey everybody's on the same page it's all verbally agreed to everybody knows this is what's going to happen um but correct but me knows? if i'm wrong aljo when you put that out there because you were first to announce it when you put it out aljo replied back confirming he did he said look i don't i don't i don't turn these things down so i think he thought he was on the same page as well so we'll see now he's out there talking about he's getting ready for a fight with sean o'malley I know. That's why. That's what, hence the reason I bring it up because Cejudo's the fight to make. Look, Cejudo uh, Cejudo, is the fight to make. I think. Look, I, to be honest with you, here, here's what I take out of it. I, I don't think anything has been signed yet. I do think there's a lot of moving parts in terms of you know where where these fights are going. See, here's this is the crazy thing about UFC scheduling, right? So you think, okay, look, we got to do Al Jermaine and we got to do Cejudo. That's what we got to do. But then you go, well, hold on, and because the UFC is doing exactly what we're doing right now. Think about this: they go into that war room, right? And they got on the board. They've got all these events. They know, you know, we got this state. We got this city. We got this. All right. All right. Is John Jones ready to go? Is, is Francis Ngannou ready to go? Because if John Jones and Francis Ngannou are ready to go, boom, we're doing that on March in Las Vegas. Boom, let's do that. All right, cool. Well, hold on. But we don't know that yet. All right. Well, okay, well, if he's not ready to go, then what are we going to do? Well, at that point, we could do Aljamain and we could do Cejudo. Well, does it make more sense to do Aljamain and Sean O'Malley if we're doing it here? Does it make more the, that's what it's all take, and that's that's what makes this so difficult, right? You know, you look at like, you know, the NBA. The NBA, we look forward to it. Hey, man, season just got announced. Boom, here it goes. Here's where you're gonna be on that date. Here's where you're gonna be on that date. Here's gonna be on this team. And mixed martial arts is different. All those things are moving. You can't lay out an entire season because you've got contract issues. You've got injury issues. You've got, uh, you know, you want guys to fight in their. You know, the the first UFC pay per view of the year is in Brazil. Of course, you want to have some Brazilian champions on there if you can, because that's you know that's something that you can sell in the market, especially. And again, they just signed a new TV contract in Brazil. These are all these things that factor into these decision making processes. So, from what I understand, the plan right now is still Aljamain and Cejudo. I think Aljamain might be trolling a little bit because he does like to troll a little bit. He right. likes to have a little fun. He likes to keep people on their toes. But to your point. Nothing has been announced yet. And I think it just goes to show how fluid everything is in the matchmaking process. Look, we're, I mean, think about it. You know, we talked about this list of things that we can't wait to see in 2023, and yet we don't know if any of them are actually happening yet. <laughs> we're, all, <laughs> we're just saying we hope they're going to happen. We didn't say, you know what I'm looking forward to, Eric? I'm looking right. forward to April 12th where this is happening in this city. We can't do that. And that's what's so mad about this. It's what's so fun about the sport, but that's what's so crazy about the sport. The things we're looking forward to, we don't even know if they're happening. One last thing on the uh, Cejudo Aljo fight is Dana White is typically pretty damn transparent when it comes to people ask him a question. Aside from it, it being a fight night, I don't make fights on fight night. Aside from that, he's usually pretty much an open book. He goes, have we announced it yet? No, we haven't announced Okay, I'm announcing it. Whatever. I'm not waiting. He hadn't said anything about this either. So, but, but going into what you said, right, about the logistical point of view, the first thing that hit my mind is a conversation we had about it. When it broke on this show, 
is that we don't think it could carry a main event of a pay-per-view. So it probably would have to be a co-main. Is it too big? Is Francis Ngannou, John Jones doesn't need a co-main like that. It doesn't need anything. So now they're looking at the pieces of, well, where would this co-main go? Because this is like the biggest co-main you could get without being a main. So it probably needs to go co-main on a main that maybe might not move the needle as not much. And that, that might be the little motion that they're, the, the dance that they're playing right now. And uh, you're 100% spot on. But it's funny, as you were as you're laying everything out, you know, you talked about Cejudo is the fight to make. And I agree from the fact that he was a champ when he walked away. You know, it's the one to make. But right now, who's the bigger star? Sean O'Malley or Henry Cejudo? Who sells more pay-per-views? Sean O'Malley or Henry Cejudo? Because I might argue with you, no disrespect to Triple C, because I agree. If we're, t- if we're talking terms of resume, if we're talking terms of accomplishments, it's Henry Cejudo all day long. You can't argue with that. You know what I mean? The, the, the championships that he holds, can't argue with that. But in terms of who's willing to pay that $79.99, who gets more people to pull out their wallet and say, I'm in? Is it Henry Cejudo or is it Sean O'Malley? To you, who is it? I think maybe Sean O'Malley. I think maybe Sean o- to me, to me, yeah, again, he's look, eccentric. Look. He's Connor esque. He's all yes. He's got. He's got. He's got uh, the 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 video game streamers wanting to watch him compete. He's got the the marijuana enthusiasts wanting to watch him compete. He's got the new generation want to watch him compete. I, it's an argument. I mean, I, you know right. what? Now, now I want to get on the phone. Now I want to get on the phone and and talk to. I got I got a friend or two over at the USC office that do some analytics and stuff. I wonder from their point of view what they think, what they would project, because that's what the USC does, right? They have business models and they project. You know, again, this is a business. It's not just a sport. It's a business. I wonder what they project as the as as the bigger matchup because part of me thinks it might be Sean O'Malley, and I don't and I don't mean that as any disrespect to Triple C because no, Cejudo, yeah. you can't argue with the accomplishments. He is by far the more accomplished mixed martial artist. There's no question about that. But Probably I'm talking the about. Most. Yeah, but I'm talking about I'm I'm talking about money. I'm talking about who appeals because that's that's yeah. that's what it is. It's it's who's willing, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, are you who are you appealing to and, and and how big of an audience are you appealing to 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 the combat sports enthusiast? Henry Cejudo is that guy. But I just wonder if maybe there's a wider range that might sell a few more pay-per-views if it's if it's Sean O'Malley. I don't know. You're you're probably right, but I'm not a I'm not a millennial or and I'm not a Gen Gen Y. So for me and my my archaic ass typewriter, Henry Cejudo moves the needle for me. He has he he's moved the needle for me since he like first came into MMA in LFA. Like that's where he started his pro career, just right yep. in LFA. He's always moved the needle because I always heard about him. Like I said, I was from Arizona, so I knew he went to Marcos Denisa High School in Arizona, and. Um, He's always moving the needle, but like I guess with these Gen Ys and their their video games and Twitches and whatever I don't know whatever else it is, <laughs> they you know O'Malley I'm sure is the bigger draw, and I'm an O'Malley fan, so I'm not uh, disrespecting the guy. I just don't live in those worlds. Basically, what Eric is saying is that we're old. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> but we're yeah, real. No, listen. It, look, it, look, I, look. I, I think it's still gonna get done. I do. I, I just think Aljamain likes likes to troll a little bit, man. He, he likes to have a little fun out there. Aljamain embraces the hate, man. I think he finally got to the point in his career where he realized, like, dude, just for whatever reason, not everybody is gonna love me. I mean, obviously, the you know the the original disqualification, you know, title win, that certainly didn't help his case or whatever. But he's had to endure hate throughout his career, and I think he finally just got to a point where he's like, you know what, you're gonna hate me. I don't care. I'm pretty happy where I'm at. So now he likes to troll a little bit. He likes to go out there and have a little fun. And I, mm-hmm. I, I think that's what he's doing here. I, I think it's still going to be Suhudo. I, I, I do think it's still going to be Suhudo. I just got to say this last thing before we end the show is I think if I'm going to put on my business hat as a business owner, I own a bunch of gyms as well as working for the Memphis Grizzlies. If I'm the UFC, I don't put O'Malley in there. His star power has risen, and it, it and the, the the ceiling from a star power marketing dollar perspective for Sean O'Malley is exponential. With that being said, stylistically, this is a not a good matchup for him. And I wouldn't kick, I wouldn't chop the legs out from underneath him before he's stratosphere level. It's a great point. That's a great point. I was, I was sitting here thinking about it. 
Do you think Cejudo is actually a better matchup for O'Malley than, than, Sterl- than Sterling-, Sterling is? Because I think about like Cejudo, obviously phenomenal. Because here's the thing. A- at the end of the day, O'Malley is a phenomenal striker, right? He's, mm-hmm. he's, he's slick. He's, he's long. He's creative. He's a great striker. But both Sterling and O'Malley, if we're talking about, we would consider them grapplers, right? I mean, everybody's well ran at this point, but we consider them grapplers. But Cejudo, more traditional wrestler, right? He's a smaller guy, great wrestling. But – I don't know if he's quite as fast as Sterling is, and I don't think he's quite as good in the scrambles and just the the you know the jujitsu type exchanges. Like, kind of like O'Malley. So, Hudo needs to close that distance. He needs to grab the body lock. He needs to hit that inside trip. That's his game, right? And he's world class at it. He's unstoppable at it. But if there was any kink in the armor that was Henry Cejudo, we saw it in the Marlon Vera fight. Or, uh, yeah, no, who who um, I forgot who it was. He, he took, like, vicious leg kicks that really, really hurt Henry Cejudo. I really do believe that Henry Cejudo is a better matchup for O'Malley I than agree. Aljo is. I agree. I, never, I hadn't really thought about that before because, obviously, that's two steps away from even happening. But as we were talking about it, I think O'Malley has a better chance against Cejudo than he does against Aljamain Sterling. But we'll see if it navigates that. But to your point, it is funny, man. I mean – O'Malley's a star and you don't want to limit his potential and his earnings. Of course, he doesn't want that either by not giving him a title shot. Cause that's where the real money comes, but you're right, man. You can put that guy in matchups that he can carry on his, on his own. Right. Cause he is such a big star. So, ah, oh, man. All right. Put that on my list of things I'm looking forward to next year as well, man. We got a whole lot of stuff to figure out. All right, there we go. We, so now we got John Jones, come back. Connor's come back. <laughs> What's happening with Henry Sudo, Hudo, Aljo, What's happening with so O'Malley? How does he fit into that equation? All that we are tremendously looking forward. We're looking forward to producing a lot more content for you guys. We're looking to take this podcast and this video podcast to the next level. Um, tremendously grateful, you know, to have this audience. And uh, John, man, you got any like whiz- words of wisdom to to carry everybody into 2023? I have no words of wisdom. I'm trying to figure <laughs> this thing out myself. No, and I'm just, I'm just excited, man. You know, it was uh, last year was kind of a crazy year for me as well. Personally, a lot of changes going on in my professional life, and 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 uh, I'm just excited for this year, man. I think there's a lot of good things on the horizon for us. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just, you know, go out there and go out there and kill it. Everybody that's, that's thinking about chasing something and doing something, go do it, man. Just life is too short. Whatever you're thinking about doing, go do it, man. Go do it. As at John Morgan underscore MMA would say go do it he is the man who has been snubbed for journalist of the year (laughs) he is the man take his word for it go do it for John Morgan I am Eric McMahon we will see you next time next week on cage side with John Morgan